Rollo May in 10 Minutes. Although existentialism was an overwhelmingly European phenomenon, there's probably been no greater advocate for integrating existential philosophy into psychology than the American psychologist Rollo May. First, let's characterize Rollo May's work in general terms. In seeking to formulate an existential psychology, Rollo May draws from the broad palette of existential thought. He's particularly influenced by Soren Kierkegaard, Friedrich Nietzsche, Martin Heidegger, and Paul Tillich, and to a lesser extent by Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, and numerous others. In addition, like many of the early existentially oriented psychologists, Rollo May is also greatly influenced by his contact with psychoanalytic thought, and the unconscious remains a recurrent motif in his work. Rollo May's work also finds confluence with the movement of humanistic psychology, so much so that he's often regarded as a humanistic psychologist proper. However, his work always retains a distinctly existential flavor. In terms of its concrete content, much of Rollo May's work crystallizes in the form of an existentially informed social critique. However, he's also greatly interested in evolving existential forms of psychotherapy. So, what is existential psychotherapy? Like existential philosophy, existential psychotherapy has to do with seeking change in our lives in relation to the reality of our existence or being. In fact, from Rollo May's point of view, any sort of change that lacks a felt connection to the reality of our existence is trivial at best. This contention, of course, already forms the contours of a critique of much of psychotherapy as we know it, especially the kinds of psychotherapy that would content themselves with simply modifying people's problematic behaviors or rearranging people's cognitions or affective reactions. For Rollo May, psychotherapy must seek change at the level of our relation to existence itself, at the level of our relation to life. Consequently, existential psychotherapy seeks change in the entire holistic pattern or gestalt of our lives rather than in only one part. But how do we change at the level of our relation to being? For Rollo May, this kind of change requires that we actually experience the reality of our existence. He calls this kind of experience an I am experience, and it forms the basis of any kind of substantive psychotherapeutic change. Of course, the I am experience can take many forms, some of them filled with anxiety, dread, anguish, and the other difficult sensations the existentialists explore. However, perhaps an easier way of getting a sense for the I am experience would be to think of times when you're really relaxing, when you're sitting on a porch swing on a bright breezy day, for instance. And as you let your normal cares begin to drift away, you might begin to notice things that were always there, but that you'd overlooked before. The smell of the breeze, for instance, or the way the sun feels on your skin. And as you settle down even more, you might have an extraordinary moment where you're just dumbstruck by the reality of existence itself, that you exist, or that anything exists for that matter. For Rollo May, these kinds of experiences are extremely important to how we relate to the reality of our lives, so existential psychotherapy attempts to honor and foster them. However, existential psychotherapy also aims at helping us move toward taking a decisive, concrete stance in life, toward committing to a way of being. Here, Rollo May's work reflects the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard's insistence on the primacy of passion and commitment, on living with a sense of existential decisiveness rather than just going through the motions. And of all the ways that we can commit to a way of being, existential psychotherapy places particular importance on moving toward authentic existence. Here, Rollo May follows the German philosopher Martin Heidegger's analysis, which indicates that while most of the time we simply defer to what they say, we also have the opportunity of glimpsing and living out our own most potentiality for being. In other words, living out our deepest possibilities as the distinct human beings we are. However, the reality of our existence is that these sorts of things don't simply happen in any systematic way. They don't come about simply because we're following some recipe or formula. Consequently, existential psychotherapy doesn't offer many specific psychotherapeutic techniques and procedures to bring them about. Instead, existential psychotherapy offers a particular attitude toward techniques rather than a body of techniques per se. 
In theory, just about any psychotherapeutic technique could be used in an existential way, even techniques such as behavior modification. However, in practice, it's probably much more common to use a technique such as Rogerian psychotherapy, with its reflective punctuation of the subtle intimations of being contained in the client's speech. Of course, as we noted earlier, another big theme that emerges in Rollo May's work is a kind of social critique. In this regard, Rollo May's work follows the larger trajectory of existential thought, which often contains an implicit critique of our mechanized way of life and the values that undergird it. In particular, Rollo May examines the alienating effects of industry and technology on our lives. For Rollo May, we live in times that foster a kind of ontological repression. In our frenetic efforts to be good producers and consumers on one hand, and to be entertained and avoid boredom on the other, we tend to lose the sense for the real depth of our lives. We lose the sense for being participants in the grand mystery of being, along with the kind of empowerment that can come with that realization. In essence, we tend to place too much emphasis on doing, so that we forget about being, a kind of systematic imbalance that runs throughout much of our modern world. Rollo May similarly speaks of a kind of epistemological loneliness that runs through our times. Our epistemological loneliness is that at the end of the day, much of what we know isn't terribly relevant to our existence as such. In reality, most of it doesn't actually benefit us where we live and breathe. For instance, think of the fraction of things you learned in all your years of school that really moved you at the level of who and what you are. For most of us, it's probably a small ratio. Or, consider the mass of information you know about commercial products, or old Seinfeld episodes, or how to operate computers, and then wonder about how much of it really matters to your soul. But, perhaps a more trenchant part of Rollo May's social critique has to do with the meaning of freedom and responsibility. According to his analysis, we typically distort the meanings of freedom and responsibility in one of two primary ways. He calls one of these highly prevalent distortions distrust of freedom, and it has to do with our world's tendency to assume that we're incapable of handling adult freedoms and responsibilities. For instance, consider our culture's prohibition of drug use. Isn't the underlying assumption here that without the mechanisms of law enforcement, we would be incapable of deciding for ourselves whether to become, say, heroin addicts? But isn't the obvious reality that those of us who are bent on becoming heroin addicts do so every day, quite irrespective of the law, and those of us who have no interest in it aren't about to do it, regardless of its legality? So then, what is the war on drugs really about? Following Rollo May's analysis of the distrust of freedom, perhaps the war on drugs is really a war on our sense of personal liberty and our responsibility for our own well-being. Or... Consider the ongoing proliferation of kindly warning labels designed to protect us from ourselves. Again, could it be that what's really going on here is an attempt to undercut our sense of personal agency and responsibility for ourselves, mostly by insinuating that we really need that kind of advice? For Rollo May, all of these are instances of a pervasive pattern of distrust of freedom that runs through our cultural terrain. However, the other principal distortion of freedom runs in the exact opposite direction, and Rollo May calls it the full freedom assumption. Basically, the full freedom assumption is the, the idea that we are, or at least should be, free in an absolute sense, with no real connection to the people around us or to the limitations imposed on us by the larger world. One place to glimpse this is in the relatively recent spate of advertisements that plays on people's investment in this kind of absolute vision of freedom. For Rollo May, this represents an infantile distortion of freedom, one that's fundamentally at odds with the existential reality we inhabit. In essence, our culture embodies and propagates a fundamental distortion of the meaning of freedom by proffering us a vision that oscillates between polar extremes of distrusting freedom on one hand and pining for a dishonest, infantile vision of it on the other. What's missing in this, of course, is the reality of freedom and responsibility as we experience them. All in all, Rollo May's work represents a powerful exhortation for us to reassume our relation to existence as one of the primary dynamics of our lives. This is true both within the domain of psychology and psychotherapy, as well as in the area of our culture more generally.
In this regard, Rollo May's work presents us with an exciting personal and cultural challenge to rebalance our lives by giving up some measure of our perennial preoccupations and distractions and to begin to live a deep and abiding relation to the reality of existence itself. And that's Rollo May in 10 minutes.